Hey, what's up guys? Thanks for stopping by the channel. So for this video, we're going to be talking about one of the uh, latest chronographs that was released from Seiko last year. And it is the uh, Seiko Speed Timer. This one on my wrist happens to be the uh, Ice Panda. So it's the more limited version. And I don't know if you guys are like me, but a lot of times I do get nostalgic uh, about some of the watches that first got me into this hobby and for me it was actually a Seiko uh, Flightmaster which was a Mecha Quartz chronograph. It was quite affordable at the time but then it got discontinued and the prices really did go up and honestly I really do miss having um, Quartz chronographs in the collection because uh, in general those type of chronographs are more affordable they don't require high service cost and the dimensions are typically better. They're not as thick as a mechanical chronograph movement. In addition, these speed timers from Seiko also now come equipped with sapphire crystals and ceramic bezel inserts. So there's a lot to like with these models. So why don't we flip the camera around now and you guys can take a closer look at this Seiko speed timer ice panda in the studio. So now that we're in the studio, we can take a closer look at this Seiko Speed Timer Ice Panda with the reference number SSC909. This watch is considered a limited edition piece. It's one of 10,000, so not that limited. And it comes in at a retail price of 700 US dollars. Now starting off with case dimensions, uh, this is a 39 millimeter case diameter. And then if I flip the watch over to the side, uh, lug to lug between my thumbs comes in right around 45.6 millimeters. I measure total case height at 13.3 uh, millimeters. That's from the bottom of the screwed down case back and then to the top of a very slightly domed sapphire crystal that's said to carry anti-reflective treatment on the underside. Although that being said, you can still get quite a bit of reflections and a lot of that is to the uh, radial sunburst dial that accompanies this particular colorway. Um, in terms of the lug opening for the supplied OEM bracelet, it's a nice even 20 millimeters. The bracelet itself is nicely brushed on the tops, polished on the flanks, and it does taper down to 18 millimeters before you hit this seiko -san clasp. The clasp is very thin and short. You have two micro adjustment anchoring points as well as a twin trigger deployment here and you can see the clasp is nicely milled out. I do believe individual links can be sized um, using Seiko's pin and collar system and for this particular model you kind of have this uh, PVD coated center link. I think that it's supposed to uh, just transition into the watch head that has that black ceramic bezel and I think it works okay although personally I would just prefer a completely brushed and steel bracelet. So here's a quick in-studio wrist shot just to give you an idea of how this watch would wear on a 19 centimeter circumference wrist. That's uh, seven and a half inches if you're going imperial. And you can see down the barrel, it sits very nice and flat on the wrist. In terms of weight, this watch comes in at 152 grams sized up for my wrist. But of course, you can also just throw this on a strap if you want to lighten the load a little bit. Now, the nickname Ice Panda obviously stems from this uh, nice ice blue sunburst style. And it just seems to propagate out from the center of the hand stack there. In terms of finishes, uh, it's very impressive for the price point. Uh, you do have nicely applied hour markers that have a combination of brushing and polishing to them. The hand stack themselves is very nicely brushed and it's a sword style handset. You can see you do have the uh, tri compacts layout, so three sub dials that are deeply sunken into the dial and they are almost a glossy black 
And if you're wondering why it's so um, glossy, part of it is related to this watch having a solar powered quartz movement. The Caliber V192 can actually run for six months when it's fully charged. And you can see at the six o'clock subdial, there's actually a fuel gauge there where the, uh, the subdial hand is currently pointing to the F, which is full. And then if you were to keep this watch in darkness, eventually it would drain the power reserve and go closer to empty. Now in terms of the other subdial layout, uh, near the nine o'clock, that's your constant or running seconds hand. So as you can see, it's just ticking away there all the time. The uh, three o'clock subdial is a 24 hour time. So that's kind of like an AM PM indicator Really not the best use for a chronograph in my opinion, but that is part of the V192 module, so it's hard to change that. Um, just below the four o'clock position, you have a deeply recessed date window. That's kind of hard to read at off angles. And then at the six o'clock position is your chronograph uh, elapsed minutes up to one hour. And it's the smallest subdial. Personally, I would have loved if they shifted to the three o'clock position and made it larger. That, or if they actually shrunk the three o'clock subdial with the 24 hour time, and also somehow managed to put the date at the three o'clock position as well. I just think it would be more functional as a chronograph overall. Now, true to being a speed timer, you can actually measure the speed of objects. Um, by combining the use of the uh, chronograph's seconds hand and the black ceramic tachymeter scale on the bezel. And in terms of operating the chronograph, it's just uh, the uh, pump style pushers uh, near the two and four o'clock positions. You don't get the same type of haptic feedback like you would say on a column wheel chronograph. Uh, it's very short travel and it's not very snappy. But a quick push of that will get this uh, chronograph seconds hand going. And then you will also note that um, instead of the uh, six o'clock subdial hand pointing um, to the fuel gauge, it will snap up to the uh, constant elapsed minutes there. This watch is water resistant down to 100 meters. Um, it's a non screw down crown to operate the movement, but it's quite large. I do wish they signed it with the Seiko S logo. But in terms of case finishing, also quite pleasing considering the price point. Uh, you have some nice high mirror polish on the sides of the case, brushing on the tops of the case, and then um, that kind of multi-stepped ceramic bezel insert is quite pleasing as well. Now in terms of low light legibility, Seiko kind of took an IWC approach where they only loomed the cardinal hour indices, so at the 12, 3, 6, and 9 o'clock position. And then the handset itself is nicely loomed with Seiko LumaBright. Now in terms of options, Seiko released a number of different speed timer models uh, in non-limited fashion. I think the Panda dial is very popular. You can also get a black dial um, or like a patina dial. And uh, they don't fetch quite the premium this one does. Although that being said, if you go to any authorized dealer, you can probably get a discount on this watch, or I've seen them come up on the secondary market for quite an affordable price. And at the end of the day, I do think this is kind of a nice successor over the Space Seiko Flightmaster. Uh, I do like the incorporation of a solar powered movement, so you don't have to change the battery, like say every two or three years. And the addition of sapphire and ceramic is welcomed um, given this price point. But there is room for improvements. I do think they could do more with the clasp on, on the bracelet for this watch. I do wish that they improved the loom and extended it to all of the applied indices. And in terms of the chronograph layout, I could definitely do without the 24 hour indicator or I wish they made the uh, running chronograph minutes subdial much larger for easy legibility. But as always guys, I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comment section of this video. And if you do enjoy this content, please consider subscribing to the channel. It helps out a lot. And as always, I can't wait to catch you guys in the next video.